Magandang umaga to our distinguished guests and a very warm welcome to our event, Unlocking Capital for Sustainability Philippines, New Election Promises and the Road to Sustainable Development. My name is Megan C, Director of Partnerships of EcoBusiness, Asia Pacific's leading media and intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development and responsible business. And I'm delighted to be your host today. The recent years have seen exciting developments in the Philippines for those of us working in the realm of sustainability. In particular, finance that aims to spur the country's sustainable growth is starting to gain ground at a very heartening pace. The Department of Finance, Central Bank and the Securities and Exchange Commission have been a key regulatory bodies driving policies for publicly listed companies and financial institutions to begin disclosing environment and social risks in their corporate governance, risk management frameworks, and strategic objectives and operations. The Central Bank Sustainable Finance Framework, which now requires banks to report on their energy investments, is an important step towards increased disclosure and better decision making in the country's development. Experts also point to the country's moratorium on new coal projects as creating an opportunity to on-stream US $30 billion worth of clean energy projects by 2030 that will spur economic growth and improve energy security. Alongside the Central Bank's Sustainable Finance Framework, the President of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has pledged a new chapter for the country of 110 million people. In the medium term, President Marcos's Freshly penned Agenda for Prosperity proposes a staggering peso 5 trillion national budget for 2023, the largest proposed budget in Philippines history, which he promises will set the country on a path towards economic transformation amid a volatile macroeconomic outlook. Meanwhile, the Philippines has been ranked 95th out of 163 countries by the latest Sustainable Development Goals Index report which indicates that while the country has made strides in its progress on the SDGs, it still has a bit of way to go in achieving sustainable development targets. Amid a peso 3.2 trillion pandemic induced debt that the Marcos Jr. administration inherited from the previous government, how will this fiscal policy unlock much needed sustainable development in the country and lead the way for long term resilience and growth? What role can sustainable finance play in a crucial fight against climate change and accelerating the adoption of clean energy to power the economy? I do not have the answers to these very important questions, and this is why we are proud to be hosting this landmark conversation, Unlocking the Bad Capital for Sustainability Philippines today, in partnership with BDO Unibank, the Philippines' largest bank by assets, as part of our ongoing efforts to cover important sustainable finance topics in the Philippines and across the region, as we seek to explore the answers to these questions together with our esteemed panel of speakers today. The virtual event will flow as follows. We will be soon hearing a recorded welcome remark from the Honorable Secretary of the Department of Finance, Dr. Benjamin Diogno, followed by a special keynote by Attorney Federico Tangongo, Senior Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer, Head of Compliance and Legal Department of BDO Unibank. And then this will be followed by a plenary discussion with distinguished panel speakers. We'll then move on to interactive Q&A and finally, a closing summary of the morning's discussion. With that, we will now hear from Secretary Jokno. Climate change is the greatest threat facing humanity today, with its devastating social and economic impacts. It requires urgent action from all levels of society. Over the past decade, the Philippines has incurred losses and damages estimated at a staggering 10 billion US dollars from climate related hazards, despite contributing only 0.3% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, climate change is a daily reality in the Philippines. We are therefore determined to be a world leader in this fight against the crisis. To demonstrate our commitment, the Philippines submitted the country's first nationally determined contribution, or NDC, in April of last year. Our first ever NDC set an ambitious goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75% by 2030. 
We recognize the critical role of sustainable finance in driving the shift to climate change adaptation and mitigation practices. Through the Green Force, co-led by the Department of Finance and the Central Bank, we will synergize public and private investments in greening business landscape and mainstreaming climate change through the financial sector. Our climate finance initiatives will promote a sustainable orchestration of grants, investments, and subsidies. Recently, we have worked with the Asian Development Bank and private sector partners in developing the Energy Transition Mechanism Project, which is the largest emission mitigation program in the world. The Energy Transition Mechanism Project will help us accelerate the retirement of coal and quicken our transition to clean energy. This comes after the government imposed a moratorium on new coal plants in October 2020. In 2021, the Philippines signed a Memorandum of Understanding on the ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program. This program will be instrumental in our bid to promote inclusive economic growth and reduce poverty incidents in the country through increased green finance flows for low carbon energy and increased energy efficiency. Earlier this year, we also launched the Philippine Sustainable Finance Roadmap. The roadmap strategically lays out our action plan to mobilize financing in order to mainstream climate action initiatives facilitate investments in climate-resilient public infrastructure, and develop projects that promote sustainable development in the Philippines. We recently issued our first ever sustainability global bonds worth one billion US dollars and sustainability samurai bonds worth 600 million US dollars. Both Transactions were met with strong demand despite the volatility in the global markets. In like manner, the Asian Development Bank has extended to the Philippines its first ever climate change policy based financing worth 250 million US dollars, making the country one of the pioneers in climate policy development financing. Under the leadership of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., we will continue to put climate action front and center in our pursuit of a robust, sustainable, and 21st century economy. The Marcos administration's legislative priorities will include measures that will improve and modernize governance in the country while promoting environmental sustainability to address climate change. For instance, we are proposing the imposition of excise tax on single-use plastics to cut plastic pollution in favor of more sustainable alternatives. We are also studying the imposition of a carbon tax in the country. We are determined to harness the vast renewable energy sources available to us, such as hydro, geothermal, wind, and solar power, to mitigate the impacts of climate change and bring down energy costs for our people. We all have the responsibility to mainstream sustainability in our respective sectors. As industry leaders, you are well positioned to make a systemic and enduring impact in greening the business landscape. Just as countries that contribute the most to the climate crisis must bear the greater task of reversing it, businesses must boldly take the lead in embracing sustainability and mainstreaming climate action in society. We will not sit idly by as the planet burns, and with it our people and the gains we have fought tooth and nail for. We intend to take all the necessary steps now and act decisively for the good of our people, our economy, and our planet. The Philippines, therefore, stands in solidarity with all nations in calling for climate justice 
and equitable solutions to this global crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Dokno, for setting the tone for today's agenda. I'm now very pleased to welcome Attorney Federico Tangoko, Senior Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer, Head of Compliance and Legal Department of BDO Unibank to give his special keynote. Attorney Tangoko, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great honor to represent BDO Unibank to deliver a special keynote for today's landmark event. Long before sustainable finance became the byword and the mandate that it has become these days, BDO has proactively sought to fund projects on renewable energy from solar, geothermal, wind, hydro to biomass, along with energy efficiency projects and the country's first green buildings. Since 2010, we have been on the lookout for renewable energy projects and have actively engaged with project proponents who bring the renewable energy projects to us, since we consider this a priority sector in financing. It is for this reason that when we were first approached to be a strategic partner with Eco Business for this event in the Philippines and for the larger Singapore event on September 21, we recognize this as a serendipitous occasion for two reasons. First, as a way to champion sustainable development for the country through sustainable finance. And second, to publicly announce BDO's approach to the energy transition. What I am about to share was approved by the BDO Board of Directors on August, 6, 20, August 26, 2022. After months of extensive discussion, research, and thoughtful deliberation, considering the context of the country and the realities that we do not control, and after being reviewed by the senior leaders and decision makers, we reached at version 26, the BDO Energy Transition Finance Statement was finally approved by our board. Our statement, the BDO Energy Transition Finance Statement, is BDO's holistic, realistic approach to the energy transition that considered the bank's economic, environmental, and social impact all anchored on good governance. To ensure that we are in, the, in this journey, we are, we are flexible, but always moving forward. Let me begin by setting the context of our state, of our finance statement. We, could, we know that any context, any commitment has a historical and specific context. Our context of the other country, the context of our people in the, in the global fight in climate change. Let me begin with the prefatory which sets the context for BDO. BDO recognizes that the banking industry plays a critical role in the Philippines' committed transition to a low-carbon economy, a transition that will require providing access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and clean energy. BDO believes that this transition is a journey that will require adopting a balanced approach this balanced approach must acknowledge the difficult trade-offs that need to be made along the way. Between national economic development that depends on affordable and reliable energy and the relentless pursuit of the broader goal of climate sustainability. The landmark Paris Accord of 2015 was an agreement among the world's governments to the common goal of limiting global temperature increase to well below two degrees Celsius, while pursuing efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. This included the goal that all coal-fired power plants must be closed by 2030 in the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and in the EU, European Union countries, and elsewhere to close it down by 2040. It is in this context that BDO supports the Paris Agreement of 2015 and the Philippines Nationally Determined Contribution, or the NDC. And we declare our approach to energy transition finance. BDO's declaration has four key components. The first component pertains to coal-related financing and divestment. Here we declare that BDO will continue its current practice of not lending to new coal fired power plant capacity, a practice that has been in place since 2019. 
it has always been the bank's way to do things quietly and efficiently. But we recognize that as the largest bank in the country, we have a responsibility to publicly articulate our commitments to our stakeholders and to disclose our actions that, have, that we have taken towards total investment in our loan portfolio. And we declare that BDO commits to reduce its coal exposure by 50% by 2033, while ensuring that its coal exposure does not exceed 2% of its total loan portfolio by 2033. We want to be specific in defining the coal exposure as exposure to new capacity. While coal exposure refers to the term loans that will naturally run their course in 2033, it does not include the short-term working capital that companies need to transition out of the coal business. We declare that ultimately BDO does not intend to finance any new capacity that will increase harmful greenhouse gas emissions in the environment. However, in a situation where the Philippine government implements provisional emergency measures to address an energy crisis, or to the extent that the country's energy resources can no longer meet its energy demand, BDO may consider extending capital for coal projects in the interest of advancing the country's social goals. We want, we want to make our intentions very clear in taking steps to lower greenhouse gas emissions. We also want to be realistic in acknowledging our ener what our energy experts and economists have been sharing for the past two years on energy security and how it may impact the economy and our people. In this context, we declare that BDO anticipates that its position on energy security in general and on coal-related financing in particular will evolve. It will evolve along the way in response to the country's economic realities, taking into consideration the government energy-related priorities and programs. BDO will continue to apply enhanced environment and social risk assessment and due diligence of customers with coal and fossil fuel investments among their businesses. BDO has long embedded social and environmental risk assessment in our lending practice through our social and environmental management system policy that we have set in place since 2010. We have enhanced our SEMS policy to further embed ENS risk management in our portfolio. The second part of the four components is our declaration on funding renewable energy alternatives. We have talked about pioneering efforts in sustainable finance. Our efforts are now focused on continuing and amplifying these initiatives. We declare that BDO will continue to expand its sustainable finance initiatives towards funding new and existing renewable energy projects to increase their capacity and to contribute to the country's avoidance of GHG emissions. This is BDO's way of supporting the country's ambitious goal for 75% reduction and avoidance of its greenhouse emissions by 2030. The third component of our transition declaration is on energy transition support to customers that are affected and to the communities affected by this transition. We declare that BDO will support its customers' transition to reduce carbon emissions by providing capital so that they may invest in innovative technologies that will lessen the greenhouse gas emissions or adapt their business to renewable energy alternatives. We declare that BDO will provide access to capital required by persons and businesses in communities negative to capital negatively affected by the energy transition to low carbon emissions. We see the social impact of the energy transition as equally important, if not more critical, as the economic and environmental impact on these communities and businesses, if we are truly to achieve a truly just and equitable transition in our country. This is why we commit to provide access capital to our customers so they can lower their emissions. Finally, the fourth component of our energy statement and our approach is on climate-related disclosure and transparency. BDO supports the recommendations of the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD the targets and commitments. With good governance as our anchor, we will be transparent and accountable for our targets and commitments. We are signing up for the globally recognized 
TCFD recommendations, which are focused on reporting on climate change, climate change actions, uh, climate risk mitigation, uh, climate change metrics and targets. As you can see, the BDO Energy Finance Statement is a landmark policy for the bank in our sustainability journey. And true to our promise, this is how we find ways to support our country's transition and our country's global commitments. In behalf of the BDO Group, we would like to thank ICO Business and the UN Environmental Program for this opportunity to be a strategic partner in sharing this message. And thank everyone here for your participation and engagement with us today. Thank you, Attorney Tankongo. We have so much to unpack from the announcement you just made on the BDO Energy Transition Finance Statement. And that's why without further ado, I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Eco Businesses Philippines Country Head, Ping Manondo, with our esteemed panel speakers. Ping, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. There's just so much to unpack and digest from what Attorney Federico Tankongo just shared with us. Um, today. And as a humanity, we're indeed excited to have conversations because obviously we're about to exit a civilization that has for centuries relied on fossil fuels to power economies, business, and our everyday life. The Philippines recognizes that sustainable development is imperative. And on that note, we are here today to follow the finance flows needed to get us to a low carbon future, which entails the biggest socioeconomic transformation we will ever stand to witness in our lifetimes since the Industrial Revolution. Let me now introduce our esteemed expert panels um, to lend more details to the announcement we just heard today. And I'll start and extremely delighted to introduce to you today in no particular order, Mr. Jean-Marc Arbogast, Country Manager Philippines International Finance Corporation, Ms. Marla Garin Alvarez, Vice President and Head, Sustainability Office Compliance Group, BDO Unibank. Dr. Shello Magno, Undersecretary, Department of Finance. And Mr. Jason Tu, CEO and Co-Founder, Neotech. Good morning to all our esteemed and distinguished panel speakers today. Good morning, Ping. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, Wonderful. everyone. Thank you very much. Let's dive straight in to you, Marla. The Energy Transition Finance Statement by BDO, the holistic, realistic approach to the energy transition. Could you please give us details on, of course, we know how um, it took um, the framework to shape up, but now what to expect as we operationalize this Energy Transition Finance Statement? So I think, first of all, there are several key messages to unpack there being, right? And uh, that is by design because we really wanted to provide a statement that um, will be the guiding principle for the bank moving forward. So it starts with coal, but in the future, we will evolve that statement to include other fossil fuels. But for now, um, this is our commitment uh, for coal. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have um, we have stopped um, financing new capacity since 2019. And as uh, Atoyni Tapongko has mentioned, the nature of the bank has always been to do things quietly and efficiently. But in this case, we recognize that it's really a part of our responsibility for our stakeholders to articulate our uh, position in terms of supporting the Paris Accord and uh, the Philippines NDC, which is why this is a very landmark uh, statement for us. So um, having, having said that, we have actually started to embed that in our sustainable finance framework. Uh, first, as um, mandated by the BSP uh, in BSP 1085, so that is embedded and uh, this statement is aligned with everything that we have been doing both internally for our operations and for our credit portfolio. And um, we intend to uh, provide additional public disclosures in our next sustainability report for 2022. And again, as mentioned, part of that uh, statement is our commitment for good governance and transparency by signing up for the task force for climate related financial disclosures as our um, as our uh, uh, 
good governance action to ensure that um, we are actually uh, meeting our commitments and updating our stakeholders on how we are implementing this uh, moving forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I'd like to get a top level uh, reaction first uh, from all our uh, panel speakers here. Um, I'll start with you, Sec, um, Shello Magno. Yeah, no, I think the, the announcement of BPO is um, very, very good in terms of setting the standard for financial uh, sustainable finance in the country, um, particularly that now the Philippines already has made its commitment for our target in reducing our carbon emission, aligning that with the various um, initiatives of the private sector, particularly the financial sector, is a significant uh, significant move. So it's uh, I really appreciate the announcement made by BDO today. Thank you. How about John Mark? Well, uh, huge congratulations to BDO uh, for actually announcing mm -hmm. that today. I think this is great. Very pleased to hear it. Very pleased to hear because you actually um, address, you know, various important aspects. You, of course, address new coal capacity and you agreed not to finance more of that, which is good. But you don't stop there. You actually also go into the other aspect, which is, in my view, even more important, which is building new capacity and renewable. So uh, being ready to finance renewable energy. Uh, and then you go even further, which is to provide, you know, make capital available to who needs it, you know, during that energy transition. So you really have a whole, you know, wholesome approach, which is uh, much appreciated. So congrats again on that. Thank you so much, Mark. And um, Jason, who is joining us from Neotech, it's an AI-backed ESG data research company. Uh, Jason, what is your take on this kind of announcement that, of course, requires a lot of details for us to look into as BDO starts to operationalize their finance statement? Yeah, well, this is uh, very exciting news to me. Uh, we've been paying attention to the uh, sustainability and uh, sustainable finance developments in Southeast Asia. And I think, um, you know, financial institutions is a very important part of the game, um, you know, based on our experience in North Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, fi financial institutions, especially banks, which has a larger footprint in the debt market, needs to move first. And then to implement these measures in their credit initiation and credit monitoring systems so that the, you know, the supply chain players, the small, medium enterprises and the larger corporations can all act together um, to adhere to uh, to certain rules set by the bank. Um, so I think uh, it's a very exciting move. And um uh, it will have a leadership effect in the, in the industry for sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just a few more questions on this announcement, and then we'll come to the other issues that are critical, um, particularly for the theme of the day, which is um, unlocking capital to finance sustainable development and a spotlight on the new promises that the Marcos administration made um, towards recovery and towards long-term sustainable growth for the country. Um, so I really appreciate as well, Barla, that um, there is a focus on assisting um, the energy transition, that it be just, because any sustainable finance commitment would lose its sustainable development legitimacy if we do not measure the social impact, right? How far have you um, seen this, um, or how far have you planned this act to ensure that current brown jobs, for example, could transition to more innovative green jobs in the light of the pandemic hammering the Filipino people deeper into poverty? This is a very important question to ask. So as uh, as we mentioned, as Attorney Fetan, uh, Attorney Tangkongko mentioned, uh, we consider the social impact as equal, if not even more critical than the environmental and economic impact because really it brings it home to every Filipino, right? Um, and as the largest bank in the country, these are our customers. These are um, the people that uh, we work with very closely. We are part of their communities. We are there uh, with our presence. And so um, it has always been uh, a crucial part of any statement. We knew that it would always be a crucial part of the statement that uh, we will um, release. And having said that, we have been... Um, we have been championing financial inclusion um, uh, since 
ever since uh, for the longest time then. And in particular, we have our BDO Network Bank, for example, which focuses on serving the needs of micro, small, and medium enterprise uh, uh, groups as its target audience. We have BDO Remit, which works with uh, overseas Filipino workers um, and uh, facilitates their remittance uh, from any part of the world to their families here in the Philippines. So we start with what we already have, which is um, quite significant. And um, we saw this during the pandemic where we were able to um, enable the uh, transfer of cash through our various products such as uh, Cash Agad in even the most remote um, places in the country. So. Mm -hmm. We only intend to uh, further um, further enhance that uh, scope and that approach um, within our sphere of influence and network as a bank, mm -hmm. which is considerable. So that's our um, network of resources, network of uh, branches, um, and from there determine where we can have the most uh, impact. Because realistically, we really cannot cover everything, but we will choose areas related to financial inclusion and supporting communities where we can have the most uh, impact related to how we are um, um, conducting sustainable um, to... Yes, Attorney Itan Konko. May I may add context? This is really built all the way into the strategy of the many years. It's not only to have a digital presence, but more so a physical presence. To put flavor in, we have our branches. We are a group of 27 corporations where there are three banks, the BDO Network Bank, BDO Private Bank, and BDO Unibank. For BDO Unibank, we have about 1,500 branches spread out across the country. And we are putting physical presence in say that you're providing that's not an empty statement we do have presence and we continue to push that presence even in a pandemic we were adding branches in the middle of the pandemic we actually grew more had more clients our clients presence, and we kept it open because that presence of an institution is a vote for that community and so that's that's part of the impact that we have. And we realize that we can leverage it for the, for sustainability. Oh, yes. What we're seeing is um, this is the sustainability is, is so part of our DNA. It's where our part of our strategy is expanding our physical reach whilst we are building our online presence. Because as as, as Asians, physical presence, physical presence is critical. When we say we will transition them, provide them capital, and help them in their own sustainable uh, transition journey, th that's 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 not an empty statement. It's a it's taking advantage or leveraging in our strategy where we go digital and physical footprint. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, putting the meat and the bones um, in that statement, um, Attorney Dan Conco. Um, just to recap, no new qualified lending for BDO since 2019, 50% coal exposure by 2023, not exceeding 2% by 2033. Exposure is only to new capacity and excludes short-term working capital to help companies shift away from coal. BDO does not intend to finance new capacity. However, if the Philippines implements policy to address an energy crisis, for example, then it might have to work within that condition. Okay, so this is a question I'll hold for um, USEC um, Shelo Magno um, in the later part of our discussion, but please put that context into mind. Now, having said that, we recognize as uh, Megan gave context that we are currently in debt from pandemic, um, the crisis that is still continuing to hammer us down, and we need to um, address short-term recovery as well as plant seeds towards a sustainable future. Um, shifting away from the coal conversation, but now to an equally controversial conversation, mining. Attorney um, Yusek uh, Magno, Dr. Magno, the finance department has announced that it is looking to tap the Philippine mining sector to address short-term recovery and better GDP performance. But how can this sector flourish while ensuring mining companies adhere to responsible and sustainable practices? 
Yeah, there are two important um, aspects in that uh, plan of the government with respect to mining. Because of, of our transition to a greener economy, a World Bank study showed that there will be a significant increase in the demand for critical minerals that are needed to transition to a greener technology. And as a country rich in mineral resources, we want to take advantage of that, not in the sense that we are going to extract all our minerals, but we want to make sure that we get the value for the minerals that we are extracting and that the prices that, that we are going to get from the minerals that are being extracted will actually reflect the, co the environmental and social costs that will um, result in the extraction of these minerals. So part of the agenda is a current proposal to actually review the fiscal policy governing the mining sector. So that proposal is expected to increase uh, proceeds to government by at least uh, 20 billion. Um, and that money will be used as additional investment for sustainable development. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is with respect to regulation. The Philippines has just again uh, joined EITI we submitted our letter of intent last Monday. So given the EITI, we hope that uh, its implementation can complement and can strengthen the regulation of the sector in the Philippines. We recognize that we actually have a pretty strong uh, policy with respect to the extractive sector. What is needed is for it to be um, implemented properly and with the framework of EITI where various stakeholders, including the industry and civil society are involved in the governance aspect. We hope to be able to minimize the social and environmental costs coming from the extractive sector. Thank you, um, Yusek Magno. So it's value addition, not just uh, being export oriented and allowing other companies or economies to take full advantage of the ores, well, we see our forests, I'll be very visual, halved, you know, um, so that we could extract the ore. The optics is just um, a bit of opposite poles, right? So, so perhaps you see the advocacy groups are getting riled up about this uh, proposal. And I guess the devil will be in the details, as you mentioned. Um, incorporating or revisiting the financial um, structure or framework um, to be able to have sustainable um, mining practices. I turn to Jean-Marc. Um, as you know, Jean-Marc, uh, we are as a country being at the tail end or also impacted by global shocks, um, the continuing invasion of Russia into Ukraine, and of course, um, the, the prolonged pandemic. And now we heard from BDO that they are in this game to transition us to cleaner energy. But if there are crises that will require us to perhaps come back to the cheaper um, sources of energy, regardless of technology, then um, there, there might be some flexibility within the bank's um, policy uh, to be able to accommodate um, energy security um, priorities. Um, how do you see the Philippines could be strengthened amid this global disruptions, which is also aligned with President Marcus's Jr.'s agenda for prosperity? Yeah, so first, again, just tell me that I'm really happy to be here with uh, colleagues from BDO because we go a long way back uh, in 2017, as a matter of fact, uh, IFC has invested $150 million in the first green bond that was issued by a financial institution, and that was BDO. And just recently, um, I believe it was in June 2022, uh, BDO again has issued the first blue bond in the country, and it was also the first for us, for IFC. Um, and of course, we go back even longer by, uh, by, supporting, the, um, by supporting BDO in its uh, sustainable finance framework and, and um, environmental and social uh, you know, frameworks. So very glad to be here. Um, as it relates to, to your question, of course, coal trans I mean, it was also good to hear the flexibility, right, that BDO has put in there. And I think this is actually the answer to the question. I think flexibility will be key because there are shocks out there. And you, we've seen now in Europe what is happening. Uh, you know, some of the countries have to actually turn back on some of those coal power plants, which is unfortunate for the environment, but is needed because of the social impact. And I think in the Philippines, what we encourage, uh, and specifically IFC, and what we really want to push is for the construction of uh, more renewable energy, base load capacity. And I think this will be key. 
It is important to decommission existing coal power plants, but it is even more important to build new capacity. Today, the Philippines, if you look on a per capita basis, what the power consumption is, it's about 1,000 kilowatt hour per year uh, in the Philippines. If you compare that to a country in Europe or in the US, it's even more. It's about seven or eight times more, 7,000, 8,000 kilowatt hour per year. So the Philippines, of course, will need a lot more capacity, power capacity going forward that will need to be financed. Um, and this is where our focus is, and we hope we can uh, we can help there. Thanks so much, Jean Marc. Um, it also uh, would put the spotlight on how data can help us leapfrog from where the Philippines is now to where it wants to be in the quickest time possible, so that whatever global disruptions may happen, we will stand resilient against those. So. Jason, the sustainable finance framework admits that the Philippines does not have its own definition yet of sustainable finance. It looks to the ICMA and other international frameworks for um, a definition. Um, how do you think data, for example, that can be used pragmatically by policy leaders and businesses help leapfrog the Philippines towards um, the decisions that it could solidly make um, to transition to net zero, for example, or to bring in more sustainable finance investments? Yeah, Ping, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, first of all, from a data and technology provider's perspective, uh, we can speak from both a macroeconomic perspective and a microeconomic perspective. So from the company or entity level, uh, we've helped a lot of uh, multinational firms or Southeast Asian firms to install devices, IoT devices, to install software, to keep track of their data. Um, a lot of we work with financial institutions, many of them would uh, complain that they, they don't get data from the the corporates, but in fact, when we work with corporates, we find out it's, it's not that they, won't, they don't want to disclose, it's simply that they don't have the data themselves. Um, so I think from the microeconomic level, and the back to many of our, you know what many of our panelists have just discussed about transition or about transition fi finance, uh, rather than purely eliminate, uh, for example, fossil fuel, um, we actually need a mechanism or need data and technology, especially you know software combined with hardware, to not only um, prove that the project is um, eligible for transitional transition finance or sustainable linked loans, for example. But in a more in a longer term, once the money goes out, uh, you have to be able to monitor uh, the, the the projects. And speaking from a different perspective, for for example, from uh, carbon emissions reduction or carbon uh, sink, for example, um, you know we've also worked with many organizations. Uh, and national at national level or municipal level or provincial level uh, in Southeast Asia to track their, uh, for example, their forestry carbon sink or in Philippines to track the um, even ocean carbon sink. Right? So that's more from a macroeconomic level where if we're talking about carbon emissions, how would we quantify? How can we compare ourselves to industry peers? And how at a national level, how can we aggregate the data together and to tell um, the, the other nations that the Philippines is progressing in the past few years or in the years to come? Right? So I think um, there's a lot of um, things, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of space left for technology companies to come in to help with the data aggregation, data management, data analysis, and even reporting. Um, back to your very first uh, mention of uh, standards, right? Uh, I think once we have all the all these data together, we can figure out the unique as aspects of uh, the Philippines, and then voice out to the international standard setters that uh, these aspects may or may not apply for Filipino companies, or um, the regional kind of uh, development of uh, of some of the schemes. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jason. We need data, solid, verifiable data to excite sustainable investments into the country as well, and to report on our progress as a country. Um, with that um, in mind, I come to um, Dr. Magno. Of course, the Department of Finance and Secretary Giacchino proposed a carbon tax in 2025. What is the status of this proposal and what considerations are being made so that the impact on businesses and individual households would not widen inequality? 
Um, currently, we don't have a draft policy yet. We are in the process of studying and how we're going to implement it. That's why it's very interesting. A while ago when we were discussing before we started that this is already being considered also in other um, Asian countries. So it's something that we're going to review so that uh, we can see the best practices in terms of implementing carbon tax. All right, wonderful. And as a follow up, um, Dr. Magno, this is the elephant in the room, which is as a journalist, I have the mandate to <clears> ask. Um, so we're talking about sustainable development. We're talking about addressing short term um, needs for the country. We're talking about Filipinos already suffering the, um, the very, very tight squeeze in their families' budgets because of you know um, how the peso is continuing to weaken. And yet there is a 3 point billion, for example, dollars of um, SA tax, for example, and, you know, um, undercovered wealth um, uh, from the, the Marcuses. Um, so, so how is the government navigating this conversation um, so that it can be channeled, for example, let's bring it to sustainable investments, let's bring it to sustainable finance. Yeah. Um, yes. So currently, the government's commitment is to actually increase annual budget for climate change programs by at least 15% uh, yearly. So with respect to our 2023 budget, um, the current um, budget for 2022 is $289.7 billion, and that will be increased to $453.1 billion in 2023, according to Secretary Pangandaman. Um, and these uh, climate change uh, expenditures are focused on food security, water security, ecosystem and environmental stability, human security, climate smart industries and services, sustainable energy, and building knowledge and capacity. And these uh, areas are not inconsistent in terms of addressing the current needs of uh, Filipinos. So those are the broader elements with respect to budget and spending of the government. The second aspect is with respect to the priority fiscal policies of the government. Yesterday, the, um, the bill that we are supporting on excise tax of single-use plastics have been reported to the plenary. So we are hoping that that will be adopted, not only to generate more revenue for the government, but also to nudge people from or to discourage them from using single-use plastic, which is a significant uh, contributor of pollution in the country. So, so far, that's the overview that we are looking at with respect to climate change program and expenditure of the government. Thank you very much, um, Yusek uh, Magno. Um, I am already excited to also move towards our interactive Q&A where our um, esteemed audience participants who are continuing to stay engaged with us, our expert co-facilitator, Ed Tong Son from the WWF Philippines, who will help us um, go through these questions and let, your, uh, let you have answers uh, for your burning questions. But just before that, I come to Marla. Um, Marla, of course, we mentioned that um, part of the um, energy transition uh, statement that was just announced um, in this morning's um, discussion is to assist um, companies to transition away from their fossil fuels or coal investment. So your latest sustainability report mentioned that BDO invested 548 billion pesos in sustainable finance projects on renewable energy, energy efficiency, green buildings, among others. But also last year, BDO Capital and Investment Corporation signed a deal as the joint issue manager and book runner for Aboitis, committing to undertake the sale and distribution of almost US $64.5 million worth of the coal developers bonds to third party investors towards GN Power, Dinginin, and GN Power Mativeles coal plant projects. So aligned with uh, the announcement just made, um, what is the coal divestment plan for BDO to eventually exit indirect um, investments and where does it currently stand? Thank you for that question, Ping. And uh, I would invite Atoyni Tangkongko to also share um, more details to address your question. But um, initially, uh, part of our statement too is enhanced uh, environmental and social risk uh, due diligence and assessment of um, our projects where um, we have clients who are invested in uh, coal or fossil fuel uh, businesses. 
And uh, we have been doing that and we expect to do more of that as we look into more granularity of our clients' portfolio with us. Uh, so initially, that has been uh, our uh, action on the risk management end. Um, but as, as a whole, you know, BDO will always assess uh, our uh, pro projects uh, or and project proponents on uh, based on a risk assessment uh, strategy. Uh, for example, you know, if if there is uh, a project uh, which is located in an area where it's uh, usually flooded, does that mean BDO will not invest in that? No, um, we will mitigate that. We will assess the risk and we will help them mitigate that. So it's the same approach um, that we use for the rest of our uh, proponents, if that makes sense. Uh, Attorney Tangkakod, would you want to add more context or uh, more feedback? All right. The, the, we know that, as we said, it's a journey for BDO. We know it's also a journey for our clients. What we will be doing it's part already of our, we are crafting a, a, a risk management policy. We are reviewing our risk management policy to embed, including into credit, uh, uh, ESNG. Now, with respect to clients, we will be reviewing anyone who has a coal, uh, coal fired power plant or anyone who has an investment related to that will be reviewed. And as we review, it will start a conversation with our uh, with our clients. Some of them may not be aware of technology so that they can transition out. Some of them may not even be aware um, of what's available. In the conversation that we will not be renewing, then that brings a conversation, what do we do next? Then we have to discuss alternatives for them. Now, there are there's a part of the alternative uh, renewable uh, resource, energy res uh, resources that uh, where we need help from uh, from both from government, the while we are willing to fund because we have to grow. Uh, the, the discussion earlier that we, the key part here, uh, other than just to lower on on, on the coal fire pump, is to increase the alternative so people will shift. However, the area of uh, even in our own portfolio, the the, the, the coal fire power plants and including those in renewable. Now, there are not that many renewable projects out there. And we have seen in the last two years, of course, that coincided with the pandemic, the, the government approved projects has not been as many as before the pandemic. We would we assume that it was impacted, the approval process or the due diligence work was impacted. We do have a robust uh, pipeline that we are now reviewing uh, renewable energy projects, but we'd really like to see more being approved uh, because uh, there is there is, I mean, there is a different uh, a different character between renewable resources and coal power uh, plants. The the ability to generate energy in terms of capacity coming from renewable uh, resources is not as big. So we need to have not only just many projects but also diverse projects. Because as you know, the technology in renewable energy, they are all moving at the speed of light and they are all developing uh, in parallel. And we believe that to transition out, to transition out of that, uh, our clients really need to have a role for uh, the business to find alternatives to what they're using. The key is telling, giving them the alternatives. We have to grow. The, uh, the the projects on the on the alternative sources of energy. Thank you very much, Attorney Tangkonke. And hopefully, as we convene more of these thought leadership conversations, we will be able to amplify um, and engage more actors in the Philippine uh, finance um, and you know business um, um, sectors uh, to put more money where the renewable energy pot is. So thank you so much for answering those two questions. Uh, we're now going to shortly move into our audience Q&A because I can see that we have members of the audience from the media. Thank you so much for joining us, representatives um, from uh, respected publications. At the same time, we have members of um, corporate um, uh, from, from corporations joining us today as well. Thank you for investing your time in this conversation. Um, I'd like to um, cap off this session before we move to the Q&A uh, with, with one question. 
Um, how do you see our polish policies? Um, what is shaping uh, the sustainable finance space in the Philippines? What are your top asks from our policy leaders? Um, I tried to bring in um, Secretary Borje from the Climate Change Commission and of course, uh, um, Secretary Latilia from the Department of Energy. And I am looking forward to another conversation where they can be there uh, to answer this question directly. But um, in their absence, what will be your top asks uh, for our policy leaders um, so that we get the incentive, we get the support to jumpstart and, and um, strengthen our sustainable finance space in the country. Let's start with Jean-Marc. Thank you. Not easy to answer a question for someone else, but uh, at least I will share our thoughts on the uh, on this topic and let me start by saying you know we've been also very pleased by the leadership in the country whether it's DOF whether it's BSP on pushing that agenda and that is really the most important and we've seen a lot of progress over the past years whether it's you know the sustainability reporting guidelines for publicly listed companies which SEC issued in 2019 whether it's the sustainability finance framework, which was mentioned a few times, or the roadmap that uh, Secretary Diokno mentioned earlier on, which was uh, launched very recently. And also quite proud to say that um, many of these initiatives have actually been supported by IFC throughout the years uh, and our sustainable banking and finance network, which we also support. So we continue to, to do that. In terms of main asks, I would say there's a couple of things. One, uh, we need, uh, you know, robust reporting and a robust monitoring framework and i think this is where you know bsp and others uh regulators can play a role in sort of uh, mandating certain aspects we need a taxonomy a clear taxonomy so that investors know what they're investing in uh, and we need capacity building also uh, across the industry whether it's investors regulators uh you know or, or the project proponents so that's what I would say are sort of the key uh, the key asks or topics that are important. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Um, Attorney Tan Konko, before I shift to over to Marla, what are your key asks from our policy leader? Well, we'd really like to see more projects approved, huge projects where we can we can put the resources or our or, or investments. So we uh, that, that's what we're looking at right now. It's really our big ask in those areas, in the area of renewables. Thank you very much. Marla? I would say the same as Jean-Marc. We are waiting, looking to a clear taxonomy, which everyone can use as reference. We also want to partner on capacity building for our supply chain, for our uh, value chain, for our customers, because there will be overlaps in many cases. And we want to help them um, also disclose. So in the same way that we are going through this journey, we want to enable our customers and our supply chain to go through the same journey based on their operations and based on uh, their risks, their capacities. And then I think the third one is really a common database that would be very helpful across sectors so that um, we can we can really base uh, decisions, informed decisions, and on the part of investors, really uh, be more specific ab about their investments if we have verifiable data and um, not so much um, uh, not so much data that is based on a lot of assumptions. If uh, if I'm making myself clear, and maybe Jason can uh, help <laughs> pound on that some more, right? But Absolutely. really, open database is something that we see as very important for this. Very good segue. Oh, thank you, Marla. Apologies. And very good segue to Jason. Um, it has been mentioned, a common taxonomy and data that is robust. Jason, your take. Yeah, I just want to echo what Marla said. Uh, data is the foundation. Uh, if you, Even if we have the taxonomy, if we don't have the data to support it, um, then it would be useless as well. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, I often ask myself this question, why would uh, companies want to share this data with us or with uh, any of the uh, the other stakeholders. And uh, I personally uh, concluded that there are only three reasons that the companies would like to work on their data and share their data. One is that their the regulators ask them to do so. 
And second reason is that their customers ask them to do so. So that's related to supply chain. And certainly is their banker ask them to do so, so that they can have cheaper access to financing. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, I think it's really uh, an ecosystem that we're trying to build uh, all together. Um, so the regulators need to have clear guidelines and requirements and uh, supply chain and the, the Customers uh, need to ask their suppliers to be more involved, engaged. At the same time, the, um, the banking and financial institutions needs to involve their uh, portfolio or engage their portfolio companies. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, last but not least, um, Yusef, Dr. Shello Magno, representing the policy side. Uh, for, for all the assets you have heard, um, what, how could you respond uh, on behalf of the Department of Finance? No, I, I completely recognize and I agree. I think John made a, a very good overview of what policies we currently have. And I think they provide a good baseline in terms of how we move forward, the taxonomy that, that we really need. I also read that in existing reports. Um, database, data-driven development, I think is very important. Prior to joining government, I was actually part of a program that supports 10 local government units into making policy making more data-driven. And as I mentioned a while ago, we are rejoining EITI. The center of EITI is actually data disclosure and monitoring of the extractive sector. So maybe looking at at EITI and how the global standards is now being reviewed to incorporate climate change and energy transition can also guide other industries in the country in terms of setting standards on the data disclosure and how we can mainstream um, data monitoring with respect to climate change and energy transition. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shello Magno. It is now my privilege to welcome my expert co-facilitator. Our chat box is now busy with questions from our highly engaged audiences. So Mr. Ed Tong Son is the Chief of Party for Sustainable Finance at WWF Philippines. Um, Ed, um, let's now fire away with questions from our audiences. Yes, uh, we have some questions in our chat box. Um, First of all, this hard hitting question was seconded by, uh, by, uh, by one of our audience members. I think it was been responded to by, uh, by the Usek Shalom uh, uh, There is a question about uh, BDO. It comes from the ICO Business Editorial section. Uh, it's about the, the Balancing Act, which BDO has to do with, when they came out with this public declaration. And let me read the question. Um, question from the Eco Business Editorial to BDO, given the positive uh, announcement to reduce its coal exposure, the reduction of coal exposure is very specifically defined, excluding the uh, short-term working capital that companies need to transition out of the coal business. However, it includes a statement that in a situation where the government needs to address an energy crisis, BDO may consider extending capital for coal projects. There's a caveat so, there. So, sorry, it's garbled. Oh. I'm sorry. So you can also read the question on the chat box. I don't know if it's, uh, it's uh, readable from your end. Um, there's a few caveats there. How does BDO balance the flexibility needed against the strong push from now to phase out coal more urgently and more completely in terms of oper operationalizing this commitment, how will BDO ensure transparency in what it finances against the ple pledges that it is making? So I think there are two questions. All right, there. if I may, uh, there are two points. The right. first one on the balancing. The balancing, uh, if you see, the, the, the caveat in the statement pertains to when the government declares a crisis. It is not a, uh, it is in other words, a, something that happens outside the control of the bank and it is something that the government itself is seeing, and we will respond to that. So we we know that there, there there's a there is a pullback from uh, from many countries in Europe because of the effect of the Ukraine war. We also see the China is scaling back. Just want to flexibility. We want our this the balancing act is for BDO to just pull back. No, it is initiated by government. By, by, by government uh, recognition 
of, of a state of affairs where the bank really has no control, but it needs to adjust. It needs to adjust. On the other part, on the commitment, we do have an annual sustainability report where we can disclose where we are in our journey or in our commitments. And as we said, the fourth part of our declaration is that we have scribed and we the disclosures required uh, that are uh, that are prescribed by, uh, I know it's not a prescriptive, the TCFD. That is an area where we will be growing and we hope to be able to disclose so that we are uh, we are transparent as to where we are in our journey and where we are in our commitments. And if I may add to that, uh, another way of looking at the Balancing Act also is um, always uh, considering that BDO has been uh, financing renewable energy projects since 2010. So at the moment, we have 54 uh, renewable energy projects all over the country at over um, 2,300 uh, total installed capacity. So this is uh, something that we have built over more than a decade of financing. So it's not something that we're just starting now. We actually have this um, proof point to show that we are into geothermal, we are into hydro, wind, biomass, bio, um, bioethanol, and uh, what did I miss? Hydro. And we do have a healthy pipeline of solar and hydro projects that, um, that are going through our uh, assessment and um, credit uh, valuation process at the moment. So we're very excited about that. And we can only continue to fund more renewable energy projects as we uh, divest from coal. So that's where the money would be going. We will be growing that. We will not be growing uh, the coal funding. So that's Thank another you. thing at the balancing act. Thank you so much. Gives us a clearer picture of the direction ahead. I'm jumping in uh, from the audience for uh, Dr. Shello Magno. Can we please elaborate on the country rejoining the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative? Quite a very relevant question, considering you highlighted the high demand for minerals to feed in electric vehicle value chains. How are we not going to make? How are we not going to miss out on this opportunity because we're putting a lot at stake? Yeah, so in July, there was a statement made by the Department of Finance prior to this administration that they are quitting the EITI, but um, Secretary Jokno already relayed to the International Board of EITI that we are rejoining and therefore we are member again of EITI. What does it mean to be a member of EITI? It means that we are going to implement the standards set by the uh, international board, and we are again going to subject the country to the regular validation done by the international board. Thank you. That question was from Diego Gabriel Robles from the business world. All right. Um, Ed, do you have any questions for our uh, panel members? There's one question from Lindin Lo, a question from the Forum for the Future. How are financial institutions currently recognizing and addressing the potential social and environmental consequences arising out of an accelerating renewable energy sector? I uh, don't know what, to whom this is addressed, but I think it's about financial institutions. I can answer uh, that. So uh, re the Go renewable ahead, energy projects, they go through the same uh, rigorous due diligence and risk assessment, similar to um, all the other projects uh, that are up for uh, financing uh, at the bank. So just because it's a renewable energy project, it doesn't mean that we are going to be lax about assessing the ENS risks for it. So it, it will be going through that same assessment and we will be working with proponents to see how we can mitigate that, how we can uh, partner with them perhaps through capacity building to address issues that uh, may arise out of uh, specific projects for that sector. And if I could invite Mark um, to also answer. Thank you, Marla. Well, actually, I think Marla answered it really, really well from a financial institution's perspective. And I don't have much more to say, except that, you know, at IFC, we're always there to support the financial institutions to develop their ENS uh, frameworks so that these new projects, renewable projects, will be assessed in accordance to our performance standards. 
Uh, and that's you know really the help we we hope we can provide uh, across the country and and globally for for this type of projects. And but it is important. Uh, we should not assume that because it's a renewable project that there is no impact. There is of course a lot of impact, whether it's social or there could be a lot of impact, whether it's social or environmental. Thank you very much. I'm getting more questions here, this time from Jessica Chan, who is um, Eco Business Managing Director. Great insights from this panel so far. Question for the speakers. What do you make of the recent backlash against ESG investing? How can we address some of the concerns and keep on track in allocating capital with high sustainability criteria in developing countries like the Philippines? So I can take that on too, or let me share my thoughts on that. So personally, I think um, there is a disconnect there in terms of the language that is being used. So first you have sustainability, which is really more of a development um, language, right? The origins of how we define sustainability comes from the development uh, sector. And then you have ESG, which comes from the accounting sector. And from an investment um perspective, that is what investors are using, looking at the environmental and social impact and the good governance of companies that they want to invest in because they need to have very specific um, data-driven, data-based um, uh, information uh, to base their investments on. And sustainability is more... Um, it's not it's not vague, but it's more all encompassing in and it changes in terms of context and in terms of its complexity. So, for example, sustainable development in the Philippines is very much different from how sustainable development would be in Iceland or in Sweden, for example. And we get to define that in our own terms. So I think that's where the uh, disconnect is coming from. And um, I personally still believe that ESG as a measure for investors is still a workable framework and something which um, would provide the data-driven uh, approach that we would want for, um, for our investors to have in terms of measuring our performance. And the, the important thing is to align that with our sustainability framework, which in our case is based on the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And there you have a bit more specificity because there are specific themes for the goals, there are specific targets to the goals, and to really make an impact there, you should be able to support at least one of the goals of the targets that you have identified in your framework. And so that has been our approach. I think I'd like to hear from you, Sek Magna, as well, uh, being uh, the champion no, uh, and the policy, from the policy leader at the Department of Finance on creating a credible criteria for um, investing in sustainability or ESG investing um, for countries like the Philippines. This is helpful as we try to attract investors. Yeah, I think the government will have a mechanism in terms of tagging what would be sustainable projects, but also there are uh, currently existing international standards in terms of determining what projects are classified as sustainable, evaluating their ESG, uh, their ESGs, their environmental impact. Uh, I've seen sustainable reports that show how uh, companies, even renewable companies that have carbon emissions, how they're making this carbon neutral. So I think uh, it's very important that this information be made public and that government uh, regulating agencies encourage the implementation and the subscription to this global sustainable standards because they add to they add value in terms of evaluating projects, evaluating performance of companies and, and in providing guidance in terms of what would be good uh, in redirecting investments. Thank you very much. Ed, please allow me to articulate this question from Jonathan Catalia at the Global Green Growth Institute Philippines for the Department of Finance and for BDO related to the plan to look into carbon tax. Are there plans as well to participate in carbon trading, quite a contentious space, I would say, such as those within the framework of Article 6? 
as I, as I mentioned, it's part of the pipeline, the carbon tax, but the details in terms of how we're going to do it, um, there's none yet. We're still studying it. Thank you, Yusek. Um, Attorney Petan or Marla, yeah. your case? On the side of BDO, we will have to wait for the governor's lead on uh, on this, and we will be we will be this. Uh, we will be this. Uh, it's not yet part of our conversation, but it will be when the, the government's lead on this uh, becomes apparent. We are monitoring developments yep. on that because we know that whatever happens in uh, Europe or North America is something that is seen as best practice and pretty soon it might come to our shores. So, you know, that's part of... Um, what we are looking into. And like uh, Yusek Shello said, we are also uh, trying to educate ourselves better to uh, understand that if and when it comes. Thank you very much, Attorney Fetan and Marla. We are indeed on the right side of history here. And it's really nice to be catching it as it happens and how we can localize the application um, in our own country, addressing our own unique sustainable development challenges. Um, Ed, would you like to um, ask the next question yeah, coming from my colleague, Megan C. No, the response from video on this next question about collaboration. And this is collaboration across the banks. Uh, video's announcement yes. today is a timely and much needed one as the country seeks to phase out of the coal business. Are there any initiatives to coordinate these efforts across the financial ecosystem? Um, example, across other banks, uh, including the development banks, which are also investing in green projects. I think the, the question on how does the private money catalyze uh, using other funds coming from different um, uh, uh, investors or development banks, meaning the area of blended financing, how does this work out in the future? Um, the short answer is at the moment, there are no coordinated efforts, but we are certainly open to partnering and working uh, with other banks in this space. Uh, I would even go so far as shout, shout out to my fellow sustainability officers. We're in a Viber group chat together. <laughs> so, you know, we, we benchmark against each other. So this is one opportunity where maybe uh, BDO can share with the others and kick off um, a collaboration. I'm loving that um, spirit, Marla. I really appreciate that from you. Um, and, and just to widen that um, question a little bit, I'd like to um, ask Jen Mark. Obviously, you are also working with not just BDO, but other uh, banks as well. Um, so, so how do you see from where you're sitting a, a collaboration um, in terms of accelerating um, and gaining more traction for, for sustainable finance in the country? No, we we actually see a lot of uh, traction, and it's good to good to see that and good to witness that a lot of communication and a lot of willingness actually to to move forward, uh, you know, with that agenda. But I would say also it's not just in the country; it's also regionally and globally. I mean, we've we've been witnessing that, and you know, over the past uh, several years now, and. Uh, and for the Philippines, I would also say it goes beyond just the financial institutions where we're seeing that. I mean, you know, we, we of course work a lot with the real sector as well, where we where we push uh, that agenda uh, very, very, uh, you know, forcefully. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, allow me please to um, ask two more related questions, this time from our audience member, Arlan Bukal and also from Rose Hossel. From Ireland, he says, it does seem that the country, government and private sector, um, is embarking on more climate change mitigation, examples of which are investment in renewables and arguably less on climate change adaptation or resilience in general. Are there initiatives or tendencies to explore um, or embark on resilience investments, biodiversity net gain, carbon credits that promote resilience? Seconding that um, is Rose who said that Climate adaptation and resilience, any plans from the Department of Finance 
on spending for these areas. Just as a backdrop, uh, a few days ago, we also hosted the Malaysian conversation on unlocking capital for sustainability. And the experts there cited that um, adaptation finance is woefully lacking. And so what is your reaction and what are the plans for us to be able to access these um, sources to help us build resilience? Yeah, I, I may I, I may answer that. Actually, uh, interestingly, it may seem that in our conversation, the priority is on mitigation. But uh, in government statements, we see that while we have a huge commitment in terms of reducing our carbon emission, uh, our global contribution is actually only just 0.3%. Um, and so the priority of the government is not so much on mitigation, but actually adaptation because of all the, the negative effects of climate change and, uh, and, and the energy crisis, the, the climate crisis to our country. So if you're going to look at all the programs being implemented by the government, majority of that is on um, adaptation rather than mitigation. And the implementation and mitigation programs uh, only 3% of that is based on the commitment of the Philippines and the 72% of that with, with respect to the 75% uh, reduction would be based on the availability of funding coming from um, developed countries, subsidizing uh, mitigation programs of uh, countries like the Philippines. With that, I believe that we've already used up all the time that we have to ask of our audience members uh, for their questions. Thank you so very much for staying engaged with us. Just before I ask my final question to our esteemed panel experts, Ed, would you have one question you'd like to ask our panel members? And then after your question, I will have my question to ask. We'll have a photo request. Please turn on your camera. We'll, we'll, we'll have, take a photo and... Um, immortalize this landmark conversation. And then I will turn the time over to my um, colleague, Megan C, for the closing. Ed, your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we, in our panel, we have uh, the banks uh, speaking to the audience. Uh, two of the policy tools uh, that are affecting banks are the bonds, the green bond standards, and the disclosure policies. However, there are many policy tools can, that can attract private finance, and we have the FIT, the feed-in tariffs, we have the subsidies, the targeted lending, credit guarantees, and uh, so many other tools. And you have the People's Survival Fund, which has been set aside by government. So how do you holistically deploy these tools in a more coherent manner to attract financing that will not only carry by the banking sector, but the whole uh, financial community, including asset managers, insurance, rating agencies, the data providers, etc. So, how does that cohere uh, in in the in the long run? Maybe do you have some ideas on that? Um, uh, I I would say I think it's it's important right now that we already have the initial document on the financial roadmap with respect to finance uh, sustainable financing. I, I would expect that additional guidelines would come from various uh, regulating agencies, particularly BSP, in terms of guiding and consolidating efforts for financial uh, sustainable financing in the country. Thank you, sir. About the something. Thanks so much, Ed. Just before my question from Arlan Bukal, um, IFC is being requested on your view, Jean-Marc. In particular, is IFC exploring possible business models to get the private sector on board the resilience adaptation investment agenda? Yes, thank you for thank you for allowing me to respond to that question because I wanted actually to come in for the previous question on adaptation, which I think is uh, is a critical um critical piece here in the Philippines, because the Philippines, as we know, is more the victim rather than uh, the one uh, emitting all the GHG and, and climate change. We, I think what's important is we're able to measure, first of all, and we have actually a tool uh, related to, so related to the, the building sector, which is called the Building Resilience Index. And that is something that measures resilience of certain buildings. We do the same on the energy efficiency side. And, you know, being able to measure uh, is is really the first aspect, and 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 being able to you know creating more resiliency, and and the building sector is actually a big uh, you know a big sector that's being impacted by by climate change, 
So that's one model we have. Um, and then, you know, um, medication is a bit easier in terms of making a bankable project. Adaptation oftentimes relates to public goods and is a bit harder to, to make it work from a bankability uh, aspect. And I think this is where blended finance is also important and bringing in other sources of money and, and having the government support this type of projects is, uh, is quite important. So we're working quite a lot on that and trying to bring uh, these aspects into, into the business model so that we can actually make adaptation projects also uh, bankable projects where the private sector is able to come in because private sector, as we all know, will be needed uh, given uh, you know, the, the constraints on, on the public side that we're experiencing. Thank you so much. Coming on to my last question for today's panel, but before that, I'd like to personally thank Marla, um, Attorney Donkonko, our partners at Video Unibank for helping us make this conversation possible. Thank you, Jean-Marc, for your time and um, Undersecretary Dr. Shello Magno, and of course, Ed, for the insights into this um, conversation. For my last question, as we are hosting a conversation that looks into the Marcus Presidency Juniors administration's finance and economic policies that will hope to um, plant seeds for sustainable future. Does the Philippines have the political will to enforce policies that will improve climate resilience? And how can investors and financial institutions navigate the short-sightedness of politics? Anyone can take that first. I'll go first. <laughs> um, we're, we are in the, in the middle of a climate crisis, so I think with respect to le leadership, we need to see convergence of leadership, not just from government, but from various, sec various sectors, so that's why I really appreciate the announcement made by BDO, and because we are in a crisis, I think uh, leadership coming from government, leadership that civil society has shown over the years, leadership from private sector, are all needed to be able to address um, and mitigate the negative impact and help communities adopt and minimize damages to, to countries like the Philippines. Thank you, Ping. Thank you, Yusek. I would write on that and really also emphasize the need for partnership across sectors, across organizations um, to really make change happen bdo by itself cannot do things on its own you know so um we want to work closely with regulators we want to closely work with our uh, peers in the industry with other sectors um i think that's what's going to be very crucial if we are going to address um, the needs of the country specifically, and if we are going to abide with uh, the agreement of uh, the Paris Accord and uh, the country's uh, commitment to that accord. So all in this together, and hopefully we can all go towards the same direction, contributing our own expertise, our own uh, resources, and exp uh, yeah, expertise and resources, and finances, funding. Yeah, I, I second what uh, Cielo and Marla have just said in terms of the leadership, of course, but in, on, in terms of partnership and coordination, I think this is the most important aspect. It is a very complex agenda uh, where many, many stakeholders are involved and having strong uh, coordination and partnership, public-private partnership in particular, are really, really, impo really, really important. I do hope that IFC has a role to play in that. I think we're, we're there to support both the private side and the public side, our sister organization, the World Bank as well, and uh, and we'll be there. We can we can help also. I think we need knowledge, uh, knowledge from uh, global knowledge, right? That uh, and and I think there also we we hope uh, we can bring that uh, to the country. Thank you. Thank you, and Attorney Tom Konko, your final thoughts, sir. I would like to say with our statement today, this has been well thought of, reviewed by the entire board. It took us time. We intend, we intend, uh, we intend to hold ourselves to this because our journey is really driven primarily by governance. This is, and we would like in giving our statement today, we want to really start a conversation in the industry. This is an area not for competition, but for cooperation and collaboration. 
and which was needed yesterday. Wise words. Thank you very much, Attorney Dunkonko, our esteemed panel speakers. And just before we wrap up, I'd like for everyone to please turn on your camera and we'll have our speakers' photos. And thank you as well to our very engaged audiences for um, joining us in today's discussion. I hope that you have come away with lots of insights um, into unlocking capital for sustainable finance in the Philippines. And now I turn the time over to Megan for the closing. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Ping, and I truly enjoyed our conversation this morning with our very esteemed panel of speakers, and thank you for a very engaged audience as well, for all the questions you posed those speakers. I think, you know, we walked away this morning uh, with lots of insights as to, you know, Philippine sustainable finance growth, um, and I'm sure we're also reeling from the huge amount of announcement made by BDO Unibank, which really sets a standard for stable finance and the renewable energy transition in the country, and EcoBusiness is very excited to track developments on this front. With that, you know, it's been an amazing morning once again with all of you here and we'd like to invite you to please join us once again um, on 15 September for our final UCFS regional event, UCFS India, and 21st September for our main hybrid event in Singapore on Unlacking Capital for Sustainability 2022. Details are on our website in the chat box as well, so do reach out to us at Eco Business if you need more info. See you again very, very soon. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone.